All right, thanks, uh, Felix. I hope my song is working, but uh, I'll just start now. Uh, so I'll just do a very brief self-introduction. Uh, I've been playing CDF since 2015, won a couple of them, but uh, no big deal. But now I'm kind of more retired from CTF and focus a bit more on the research and uh, the real life programming stuff. So yeah, there'll be three key areas that I'll be covering for the day. Uh, the first being an introduction to symbolic execution, second introduction to anger, and lastly, the common roadblocks that you may face when you use anger for symbolic execution and how do we use anger's tools to uh, resolve them. So before we do that, I would just like to explain a little bit uh, why do we need symbolic execution. So in reverse engineering CDF challenges, we can roughly categorize them into the two different uh, categories, one being the easy one, the trivial ones, and the other being the not so trivial one. Although they may look very similar uh, in, the, in the code, but the first trivial ones is just a simple string comparison. While the complex one with a complex check function may have very complicated logic or very deeply nested uh, paths that uh, you need to uh, reverse engineer in order to solve the, for the input that they are expecting you to put in. So this not so trivial one can range from very easy to very, very difficult. Just to give you an example of how a complex function might look like, this is a decompilation with intra decompiler. This, uh, for seasoned reverse engineers, uh, this may not look so intimidating. And I mean, it's just a bunch of if conditions that need to be satisfied. You can still work this out by uh, pen and paper. And, or maybe you can even write a script to pass all this, but it's gonna take you a long time to figure out what the input is in order to satisfy all these conditions. And this is where symbolic execution comes in. We can imagine this uh, every input as a symbolic value, meaning that we do not give it a concrete value yet, something like an algebra of x. Then we can basically use this symbolic value and work through all the possible paths of execution in a binary and collect the constraints on the input if, uh, as we walk through the paths. And you can think of this like we are just trying to find out what the equations that is going to operate on this x. And at the end of the path that we want, usually the win condition, the one that outputs that you get a flag or something like that, um, we can check the constraint on the input and use a set solver in order to uh, solve for this uh, input. To illustrate uh, more simply, we can take a look at this uh, Python program right here. We have two if conditions and basically we have two different end results. One that you print that you win and the other one being it prints out that you lose. Of course, we want the win condition. So as usual, we take this particular X as a symbol, a symbolic value. And at the first if condition, we can basically create two different possible state. One state is when X is smaller than 10, the other being X bigger than 10, bigger or equal than 10. So we have state A and state AB. We know that state AA leads to this loose condition, so we don't want it. We can discard it from state AB, we build on and go to the next branching, basically creates two new different states, the ABB and ABA. And ABB is the one where we end up in the loose uh, condition, which is something we don't want. And we basically end with state ABA is the one we want. And looking at the constraint, we are able to solve for X very easily from here. And if we bring this, uh, scale this problem up to something similar to our previous challenge, instead of a single X, we have something like an input string where the execution path may look something like this, where if you fail the condition, you go to the, fail, the false branch. And if you pass the condition, you do the next check. And after you finish all, all the checks on the conditions, you get, a, you get a return true state. And if you walk through all these possible paths and we reach this return true state, and basically we can take this constraint on all the different input characters and use a set solver to solve for every single one of them, we will be able to get what input is actually expected for us to reach this particular true state. So, but managing all these symbols and this uh, binary emulation is not gonna be easy. It's gonna be very, very difficult and very troublesome. That's why we have anger, which is the symbolic execution engine and a binary analysis framework. And it's something that we can use to automate these CTF challenges. And it has a lot of black magic uh, analysis tools that you can go and explore. So like what I said, you basically provide a front end that to help us to automate most of this groundwork required to manage these symbols and this execution paths. 
Although some light reverse engineering still is still required to speed up the process, and sometimes it's even necessary to uh, reverse engineer a bit in order for us to find what we want. Okay, so to understand angle, we need to understand a few terminologies first. First being the project, which is the usually the starting point for any angle analysis. It represents an initialization image for the binary that we are analyzing. So it basically contain all the loader information and how do we load this uh, binary into the, into the pro, uh, project and the angle framework. Then second being state, and it just represents a simulated program state, like the state AA, state AB and all that, uh, something like this. But in here, we are not storing actual variables because we are looking at binaries. So this state actually contains uh, symbolic values for registers, memory location, and uh, stack information and all that. And Angle uses factory methods to create other Angle objects. And one of those objects is something uh, is called a simulation manager, which allows us to work from, go from one state to the next state. You can imagine it as a, something like a state machine where we transition from one state to the other as we simulate this uh, in, in this Angle framework. And this simulation manager, uh, what I said, is created through this uh, factory method right here using this API. And a note is that uh, we, is that we can modify the state between in between this uh well, as we walk through these states, and uh, or even before we pa pass this state to the simulation manager, we can make modification to it however we, however we want. So it's yeah, it's just like a state machine. Well, here is a bird's eye view of the angle workflow. First, we have the binary, usually the the challenge file. We load it into the angle project, and this project gives us this factory method that we can create the program state the initial program state that we want, and we create a simulation manager. We feed this particular program state into this simulation manager. And after doing some analysis running, we reach a particular end state. At this end state, we can check whether is it the one we want. If it is the one we want, we check the constraint and solve for the constraint, we get the input that we want. And if it is not, we can just discard this particular end state. So here is the, actually the source code of that complex function that I showed you all earlier with the decompilation. It's a very simple uh, check function with a bunch of each conditions here. It's just a 32 byte string. This is considered like the hollow world of using Angular to solve reverse engineering challenges. So to solve something like this, we basically initialize uh, Angular with this uh, project first. Then we can define a symbol uh, called flag, which is just 32 characters. And we use scarypy here for, to represent the symbol. It's just another library to uh, represent stuff. So we pass in this symbol to the STD in, which because this program reads from the STD in, and we create this initial state. Before we pass this initial state to the simulation manager, we want to configure the solver to make sure this STD in is only, uh, we only can use printable characters. So you can see that for every K in flat charts, we do all this. Then we pass the, the initial state to simulation manager and we basically get a simulation manager that can uh, transition this initial state and do things with it. Yeah. And remember that I say that we want to find conditions that we want and the condi I want to avoid those places, uh, those loose conditions that we don't want. There's two different ways of doing it. One is through instruction addresses, we, which require you to do some reverse engineering to find the exact address where they they put the good job and where's the exact location, they, they output the try harder, the try harder be, being the failure condition. So we just pass in these sets of addresses into the simulation explore API, this method call, and it will automatically find the input that uh, give us the, this uh, good job output, which is the win condition. Uh, but what I personally prefer is to use conditions, the one shown on the right here, which basically at every state, you basically run this condition check and see whether is the state is the one that we want to find or is the state that we want to try to avoid. And if you pass this uh, things as lambdas to this explore, Angle is smart enough to figure out you, now you're not passing in set of addresses, you're passing lambdas and you're gonna use this to uh, perform the analysis for you. And at the end, you see both sides of the code is actually very similar. We found a solution state where it, it gets the fine condition and we can basically dump the STD in, which is the from dumps zero, which is a STD in for descriptor. And we'll be able to get the flag. Okay, for demo one, I will show you with together with demo two uh, in the interest of time. So I will go on first. 
So if you have any experience with GitHub tools, right, is that when we use them, it's often, it often work great on the examples they give, but it usually breaks when we try to solve any challenges. And Angular is no exception to that. And here are some of the potential problems that you are actually facing when you are trying to use Angular beyond a Hello World program. So the first being uh, unsupported library costs, and second, the symbolic path explosion. I will go through them one by one. So the first thing is something like a, a library course. Uh, here I'm using libc scanf as an example, but you can think of it as something that is a custom library method that has a very complicated internal instruction for validations and passing. So a lot of if branchings. Remember, every if condition, we create additional states to basically maintain the state until we we can de determine that this is not the one we want, we can, then we can discard it. But during the validation and passing is unlikely we can discard anything. So we create a lot of unnecessary states if we have a, very, a custom library method that has this complicated, complicated internal instructions. And scanf is something like that, but Angular does have a lot of libc implementation done already, but I will still use scanf as an example. Uh, in the real world, you if you can reverse engineer this custom library methods and realize uh, how to rewrite this in Python, and you can basically replace that with a uh, Python code, and you can save a lot of uh, time and a lot less state that you need to export. And hey, okay, wrong button. Okay, the challenge I'll be using is from this Angular CTF repo. It's a little bit dated, but it still has a lot of uh, good information there. Uh, a good way to learn Angular if you want to. So the way we're going to do it is through hooks and sim procedures. So hook is basically, you will hijack the code at a particular instruction address at, or a particular symbol, and you perform some operation on the program state, then, con then let it continue. And the same procedure is just a Pythonic way to emulate operations and that are used in this uh, function calls. You will see an example later. But to visualize this is something like this. So in the assembly, we may have something called, like call the scanf, and we have this scanf method, and you will have the rest of the code from the library itself. But we don't want to run all this library code, right? So we basically link it to this scanf sim procedure, which is written in Python by us, and we skip the rest of the code. In this case, because we are running in Python code, we do not really create that many states as if we, if we are supposed to analyze the rest of the library. So that this is just the, this is the code that in order to simulate scanf in the specific case that we are using in our uh, this target, which. As you can see, we just need to overload this run method and we can pass in the arguments as just like how uh, it is used in the program itself. And the, the beautiful thing about sim procedure is that it is able to uh, use the calling conventions of the different binary system, uh, things that you are, you are trying to, the architecture that you are trying to run, and it's gonna able to extract out the argument for you. So you do not need to basically hook at a particular address and manually go into the register to extract this information. Angle will do it for you with same procedures. And here we can see we have the format string, the password one address and the password two address. So we just simulate this by just injecting two symbols, password one and password two to this P1, P2 address in the state memory. Then we can save it into the global dictionary, which uh, we can use it later, or we can, uh, yeah, it's just something that we can use to store information across the states. So yeah, then at the end, we have this same procedure defined. We just need to hook the scanf symbol and it will work. Okay, now it's time for the demo. So this is the demo for the, for the first one, which is just a very simple setup. Uh, I have two different setup. One is using the addresses, which I will not be using. I will be using this solution too, which is the condition. I will just let the code run on this task while I go to the next one here. The source code uh, for the script is right here. Like the one I show you is, some, is something like here. And the rest of the code, as you can see, is basically the same as the previous one with, with maybe some a little bit exception here for resolution. But if we run this onto this, CTF challenge. We just give it a while and we check the previous one. As you can see, we already found the flag. If you realize that in our code, we actually never needed to understand what complex function is doing, our check function is doing, and we are still able to get a flag. And for the next one, it's already solved and it's written to a password.txt file. So if we cut get the password and pass it into the challenge, we can see the good job is printed, means we solved the challenge. And it's just simple as that. 
Okay, that's the end of demo two. So I will go on to the last roadblock, but this is definitely not, not, the, not the last roadblock you're gonna face, but given time constraints, so I'm just gonna show you two. Uh, this is symbolic path explosion, and it's very common when it comes to symbolic execution, and usually caused by large loops or large binaries. For large binaries, it's similar to the library problem. You, you still do need to do some uh, analysis yourself and know which sections that you do not want to run and just simulate it with your Python scene procedures. And it's more case by case basis. But a more common problem is actually for, at least for CTF challenges, is due to large loops. And Angle tries to optimize this, but it's not very good if you do not have like some heuristic uh, to help it. And to do that, we just actually need to modify the previous challenge to use 64 bytes string instead of two eight byte string instead. And this bottom loop, where we use if to check instead of string compare uh, to check every single character is enough to break uh, our demo two solution. I can show you how long it will take uh, if you want to, but uh, I'll not show it now because time constraint, yes. So to see why this happens graphically is because something like this. Remember why I say when every if condition we have a branch, we will create two branches. So in this case is similar at every index, right? At every index, we create two branches. And if you know how binary tree works, with a height of 64, we are going to have two to the power of 64 different states. And Angle need to check every single state for whether is it the win or the lose condition. So that is going to be a lot of states that you're going to run. And your computer and my computer is never going to finish running in it. So how can we solve this? My, so what if we think of loops right, as if they are functions? And if you hook the loop at the starting address and we skip the loop and replace the whatever logic inside the loop with sim procedures or hook methods, we are basically able to uh, reduce this to the power of 64 states to one or maybe two different states. And the first hook, uh, first loop is going to require some uh, additional uh, challenges because there's a modification to the control flow where we jump out of the loop and go to this complex function. Uh, so we, are, we shall not uh, cover this yet. We just take a look at the second one, which is the one that is going to cause us the biggest problem. This one is uh, relatively simple, and I can just show you the code right here. So basically, we hook it at the start of the, the loop, and we want, to, we want the hook to be the length of, all the way until the end of the loop. So we just can do something like this and write the code here. And at this state, we basically load the from globals globals remember the scanf you can save anything into the globals so for me i just save where the user input string address in the memory is into this global buff lock and we load this uh user input string and this expected string is uh, gotten through reverse engineering they are checking one character by one character for this one and then we just manually inject uh, another symbol by deciding whether this input string is equal to this expected string this RVP minus 0x11 is actually just the is correct Boolean that uh, variable that we can get from, once again, a little bit of light reverse engineering. And then we can inject this symbol uh, based on these conditions. And with that, we are actually able to solve this particular challenge, but we are not going to stop here. We're going to try to hook the first loop also. And here is the assembly, uh, this assembly of the loop. And yeah, it's going it, it's not so easy to see from here. So let's just simplify to uh, about what the first loop is actually doing. So the first loop, the first thing it's going to do is call the complex function. After running the complex function, it's going to store the result into the memory. And you will check, is it the end? If it's the end, we jump out of the loop. If it's not the end, we increase the index number. So here is the same procedure. And I know it's a little bit long, so I label each section for you here. For calling out the complex function, we just once again, overload the run uh, and just initialize our IDX and use this self dot call uh, to basically jump to the function address and pass in the arguments and use this post complex, which actually refers to this same procedure. We all remember Angle we simulating this uh, this thing and this complex function actually do not know where it's supposed to return to, so you need to define where you want to return to in the same procedure, which is the post complex method. And in the post complex method, meaning we have finish running the complex function, we want to retrieve the return value, which is stored in the RX. But since we know that we are only retrieving a single byte, we just retrieve A out from here. And we store it into our memory location. And just like that, we are able to hook the first loop and yeah, we are good. 
Oh yeah, the last part, this last box is just doing the index change and uh, jumping out if, if it's, we've reached the final index. So this is the last demo. Uh, I can here. Okay, so here, okay, this is not the code. Oh, this is a no hook code. No hook is the same uh, as the other one. Okay, so here is the code. The rest, most of the is still remain the same. The difference is we include the addresses for the for the different loops, the function address and the loops in procedure, second loop and all that. And we can run the hook, solve for both. And run it on this. And just to illustrate uh, how slow If you try to solve without any hook, we'll just let it run. Then after q and I will show you that it's still not done. All right. So we have once again, we have the string that we want and it's written to parcel.txt. So we can take a look. Is this one. We cut it into our, met, uh, our challenge here and we get good job. Basically, we solve the challenge. And that is... Uh, Okay, there's a food for thought. What if we combine these two techniques? Uh, what if this complex function is actually within the, the loop where you do the if checks and how can you use in procedure to bypass it? Time constraint, no way that I can cover this, but uh, we can discuss this later if you want. And here are the source for my this uh, little presentation. And if you have any questions, you can, you can type it in the chat. And, or you can reach me at this particular Telegram handle. So yeah, that's the end of my presentation. I will take a look at the questions now. Have you tried other symbolic execution tools? Actually, no. I mostly just use Angle for all the binary stuff, yeah. Is it true if solution is not unique and returns less significantly the smallest one? Actually, this depends on the solver, Z3. Uh, I'm not sure how it does it, but I don't think it's actually deterministic. Like, uh, un, like a non-unique solution will actually return many different uh many different results at different time you run it. So yeah, it is it, not necessarily the less graphically smallest one. Yeah, it's just a Z3 solver. Tools with UI integration into your decompiler. Uh, I mean that that's true, but uh, I I tend to use CLI a bit, uh, quite a bit. So, I mean, I can look into that. Maybe I get angle working on my my Gitra or Ida or something like that. How would you know? How do you know if a challenge is solvable by angle? Uh, usually you can. You can try, you try to use the angle to solve it when you see a lot of uh, complicated condition brancher, branching and all that. And you can mitigate the loop symbolic path explosion issues uh, with, with uh, what I just said. And you try to figure out why your code is not running. And if really, really it do just doesn't work, then you can always go back to the old school. Because angle symbolic execution just to provide you with a more automated way of solving these challenges. And it's, once you write the script, it's not gonna, you can just let it run and you can do something else. So yeah, if you, you can't really tell by first glance, but one thing I know for sure is that it doesn't really support uh, multi-processing and multi-threading very well. So if your program depends on Fox, then uh, it's, it's gonna be probably not gonna be solvable by anger, yeah. Is this? Ah, that's a lot of new tools. Binary Ninja. I don't have Binary Ninja though. <laughs> Reverse encryption. Uh, no. If we, if we can use that to reverse hashing and uh, 
reverse hashing and reverse encryption, then, then those are not really encryption anymore. So yeah, I think it's something to do with information loss or something like that. Custom encryptions, uh, yeah, like what Daniel said, uh, block ciphers is definitely not possible. Custom encryption, depending on how they implement it, but it's definitely not something that you can just, anger is just not something you can throw it at uh, anything and you will just magically solve it for you. Yeah, for crypto questions, Kelsey is more, <laughs> is more was it, qualified to answer than me. Yeah. Hey. Okay. 